Good morning. It's Monday, the third of June, and this is Govind Raj Ethi Raj broadcasting and streaming from and headquartered in Mumbai, India's financial capital. Before we go ahead, yes, the exit polls are out and predicting a sound victory for the BJP in the 2024 general elections in India. There has been some intermediate jitteriness because of, among other things, slightly lower election turnouts. But the markets have been predicting exactly this, as the core report has also been reporting. Now, exit polls generally get the direction right, even if they get the margins wrong. Now, that can work on the higher or lower side. At least that's the general feeling. Either way, the markets look well poised for today. That's Monday. Counting, of course, is tomorrow. That's the fourth of June. As a background to form the government, any party or coalition needs to have 272 seats, which is the halfway mark in the Lok Sabha or the lower house of India's parliament. India's general or parliamentary elections are held every five years. Our top stories and themes for today: the stock markets are set to open gap up, which means they will open on the higher side in the morning and perhaps stay there. Oil prices fall to around eighty-one dollars a barrel, even as major oil producers extend supply cuts. India's GDP numbers surprise again on the upside, but economists are now preferring to use gross value added or GVA. Here's why: rising commodity prices and the impact of weather major challenges before the new government. And electric vehicle sales decline in India in May, perhaps for the first time. This is a core report with Govind Raj Athiraj. Market set to open up. Before I come to markets for Monday, June third, which are set to open with a gap up and then land higher later. Election results will become clearer on the final picture, at least only after June fourth, that is tomorrow. Of course, the stock markets have been predicting, projecting, and pricing in a victory for the BJP for several months now. So the question is, of course, valuations and how much appetite there is at these levels, and more on that shortly. Just to recap, last week we saw record highs on Monday, the twenty seventh of May, or same time last week, with the BSE Sensex hitting a high of seventy six thousand ten, but closing the week two point five percent or two thousand forty nine points lower at about seventy three thousand nine sixty levels. Similarly, the NSE Nifty Fifty hit an all time high of twenty three thousand one 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 or triple one, but closed the week with a loss of around two point seven percent or five eighty points at twenty two thousand five thirty one. Now. This should give you a sense on where the market could go back between Monday and Tuesday before setting a fresh course. The Nifty mid cap 150 and the Nifty small cap 250 indices were down more. That is, incidentally, by about three percent and 2.3 percent from their record highs. So the market is being driven by sentiment, which could give way to fresh policy moves by government or expectations of them, and possibly signals that suggest fresh investments by businesses. More on all of that in a moment. I reached out to Mihir Vora, Chief Investment Officer of the recently launched Trust Mutual Fund's new Flexi Cap Fund, which closed on April nineteenth and has already begun investing in the market. So that should give you a slightly fresh perspective. I began by asking him how he was seeing the market mood, picking up on the exit polls, before asking him about the medium term outlook and what kind of themes that he was focusing on, particularly in a market that was seeing, or rather, is seeing higher valuations. So yes, uh, the exit polls do point to continuity of the existing regime, which is good because the market wants continuity. And as you rightly mentioned, the markets are positioned for continuity, and any kind of mandate to the contrary would have actually led to a sharp correction in the market. So while the markets have done well in the past few months, I think there might be some more steam left after the re- actual results are out. And if if hopefully the results are in line with exit polls, then it should be a positive for the market. So there might be some steam left. Uh, three or four factors, I would say, why I think there is some more to go. First is that there is institutional, you know, cash and institutional positions which which are you know there in the market. So there is some cash waiting to be deployed, I guess, because typically you do see institutions would keep some cash in case of any event to capitalize on an opportunity. So I'm sure there's some extra cash out there waiting to be deployed. That's one. Second is if you see the FIIs, their derivatives position, especially in the index futures. Are at record shorts. So FII short positions in Nifty futures are at uh, you know all time highs. So I don't know whether it's because of hedging or naked or whatever, but whatever the case is, they are short in the derivative segment. And uh, you know if the market uh, opens up with a gap up, then uh, obviously they'll have to cover some of those positions too. So you might see some some bit of upside to the market because of short covering also, especially by FIIs. 
the HNIs and local institutions are long, but the FIs are on the short side in a significant way. They said to a record level. So that's another technical factor, I would say, apart from the institutional cash waiting on the sidelines and the FIM money. So that's, that's another point. The other two things that I see is one is uh, many businesses would have been and corporates would have been waiting for a formation of policy continuity before they announce any big bang plans. So some of the plans which may already be there in the pipeline might start to get announced now, which which can create a further feel good as far as the private sector capex is concerned. And third is the the prime minister himself has and the, uh, most of the ministers on the roadshow during the elections have been pointing to our action packed hundred days, first hundred days, big bang policy announcements, some hard measures, etc. So that that also will keep the market, I guess, engaged and in anticipation mode. So I think in general there should be a bullish undertone in anticipation too. I would say. Right. So the question that follows, or rather there are two questions, I think. So one is, of course, we are already at peak markets. I mean, we just had an all-time high, though we've come back a little bit. And I'm assuming that can surely be recovered in the next couple of days. But if at these peaks, how do things look from a valuation point of view, which I guess is the logical question. Second is, how are things looking in a, in a slightly more uh, longer term, as let's say a few months as opposed to a few days? So, in terms of valuations, of course, you know, you have seen stocks which have been backed by government policy do extremely well. And their valuations have gone up uh, quite significantly, especially, you know, in the infra segment, the cap goods segment, some of the electronic manufacturing, etc. Those kind of segments have seen some pro- some of the PSU with low floating stock, defense, etc. They have seen a lot of action. And then, of course, the valuation comfort is no longer as good as it used to be uh, set six months down the line, six months before or two years before. So obviously one needs to be a little more uh, you know, choosy out there. But uh, in general, if you look at the broad market, for example, the largest segment is uh, financials, banking and financials. And not only banking, but NBFCs and other financials like insurance, uh, capital markets, playing wealth management, broking. That segment is not that overvalued. Especially the banks and NBFCs have underperformed, right? In the last 12 to 15 months, they have underperformed significantly. IT, the second largest sector is IT. That is also underperformed. So valuation in the two biggest segments are, are reasonable. Metals, energy stocks are anyway typically not that expensive in any case. So if you look at the large cap, larger portion of the market, it's not that expensive. So there is, you know, steam as far as valuations is concerned. Of course, as I said, there are pockets of all valuation where we need to be careful. And of course, be careful about you know, not so great managements, uh, unscrupulous uh, promoters, etc. Those quality filters anyway need to be there. I think your second question was more on the on the longer term. So there, I'm very clear that we cannot grow on consumption alone. We have to have physical asset creation, and that would include manufacturing capacities, infrastructure, real estate. And the government has been doing a lot of, along those lines in the last few years. And I think that only needs to accelerate. Without physical asset creation in these three pockets, manufacturing, infra, and uh, real estate, I don't think we can grow beyond 5.5%. The 7 to 8% aspirational long-term GDP growth rate has to come from these segments. So I think that is one significant focus that is likely to be there, which is continuing and which has been there and will continue in the new regime, hopefully. So to that extent, we might see a lot of action of uh, private sector, CapEx, which we were hoping to, accelerate. So far, in the last 3-4 years, government capex has sustained the growth momentum, but the government I'm sure now wants the private sector to chip in. And of course, it's trying to help as much as possible by introducing more and more PLI schemes and all those things. So, I think that's the one big thing that we need to watch out for, apart from the rural recovery in consumption. And what are the kind of themes that you're looking at, Mihir, from your fund's point of view? So, as I said, physical asset creation is one big theme. So, that includes the whole gamut of stocks capital goods, construction, infra, utilities, real estate, and then the the special focus areas like defense and railways where the government is you know going to pick up the capex in any case because of indigenization, etc. So that's physical asset creation, including real estate is one big thing. Second big thing over the long term we are playing is premium consumption. As the demographics are changing and the income income level migration is happening, we will see more and more acceleration of demand in the higher income brackets. Essentially, you know, premium goods, premium services, travel, tourism, lifestyle kind of thing. So that is one broad thing we are playing. And that will also include more and more financialization of savings. So, of course, banks is an integral part. But apart from that, the newer segments like insurance, wealth management, capital market, broking link segments, etc. They will grow faster than the rest of the economy. 
So that's another the demographic link, the premium consumption and financialization that we are playing. And the third is uh, disruptive business models using technology. So all these five, six big new age companies that we have seen getting listed are just the tip of the iceberg. I see at least 20, 30 more such companies getting listed in the next three to five years, which will create a lot of wealth. Not all of them will be winners, but the ones uh, who will uh, stay will, you know, winner takes all kind of scenario. And we should see good wealth creation in this segment. Probably there was a, you know, one stand report a couple of years back that in the next five to seven years, maybe five to 10% of the market cap can actually come from these new companies. Right. So when you talked about financialization, are you saying that's a revival or is it fresh acceleration, so to speak? Uh, see, financialization, when I say of savings, is that more penetration of products and services linked to savings. So earlier when we talked about finance, uh, it used to be credit growth. Now, credit growth, of course, has to be there. So that stays as it is. But that's a positive in any case. But I'm saying that the companies which are channelizing savings will grow at a faster rate because savings will grow at a faster rate than the rest of the economy because of the income level migration. The growth in services and activities and products linked to savings, channelization like insurance, wealth management, broking, exchanges, those kind of services will grow faster than the rest of the financial services also. Got it. Okay, so you are seeing a fresh acceleration. Great. Mir, thank you so much for joining me. Always a pleasure, Govind. Oil prices fall even as producers extend supply cuts. Now, in all the election excitement, one piece of good news is that oil prices are falling now a shade above $81 a barrel. This is obviously good news for India too and helps keep overall outlook for inflation stable to low. Meanwhile, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries Plus or OPEC Plus has agreed to extend its supply cuts according to delegates as the group continues its efforts to avert a global surplus and shore up prices, Bloomberg reported on Sunday, also adding that cuts from key members including Saudi Arabia and Russia, which total about 2 million barrels a day, were set to expire at the end of June but will now continue until the end of 2024. OPEC Plus ministers gathered on Sunday for a meeting to decide oil policy with some attending in person talks at the Ritz Hotel in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and others participating online, said Bloomberg. So the voluntary cuts in production were broadly expected and were seen as a response to rising production from rivals like the United States. While crude prices briefly soared above $90 a barrel in April after conflict in the Middle East threatened regional exports, they've since declined, says Bloomberg. Brent futures are around $81 a barrel as of May 31st, which is almost down 7% for the month of May. Heat dust and price rises, key challenges ahead. India is seeing unprecedented heat waves and loss to life. At least 33 people, including election officials on duty, died of suspected heat stroke in India's states of Bihar, Uttar Pradesh and Odisha on Friday. And the heat wave in the region is expected to continue this week, authorities said and quoted by Reuters. Now, globally, 2024's first four months were the warmest in 175 years, according to the National Centers for Environmental Information. It is not surprising, perhaps, that India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi's first meetings post the conclusion of the last wave of elections on June the 1st are meetings linked to weather. The first meeting was to review a post-cyclone situation in the east and northeast of India and the other to review the heat wave situations, according to Newswires. Now, the heat waves are mostly in the north, west and even southern parts of India, as we've been tracking. But around the world, and not just in India, it's going to get much worse. Odds are growing that 2024 will become the hottest year in history as the Northern Hemisphere goes into summer. Prices for some of the world's most vital commodities, that's natural gas, power and staple crops like wheat and soy, are climbing, says Bloomberg. The world of shipping, already reeling from crisis in the Red Sea to the Panama Canal, is also likely to be affected by parched waterways, which means much lower water levels. The Rhine River, for example, Europe's busiest commercial waterway, which moves everything from diesel to coal inland from the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, has seen record low water levels in the recent years, almost similar to the Panama Canal. Now, low levels mean either very few ships can move or perhaps no ships can move depending on the level of water at that point of time. Now, this is something that the world at large has not seen. The potential for destructive wildfires is increasing as well, says Bloomberg, and wild weather driven by climate change will thus affect cost of energy, food and fuel. 
Moreover, frequent natural disasters will affect everything, including the cost of financing projects. Think of Dubai Airport crippled by floods just two months ago. Last year, extreme weather and earthquakes inflicted global losses of about $250 billion, according to Munich Reinsurance or Munich Re. Some experts are predicting U.S. natural gas prices could jump more than 50%, while wheat and coffee markets are also expected to rally. Now, all of this means that the government that takes charge in India in a few days will have to grapple with climate-linked problems and challenges ahead of many others, perhaps, which it would have had on its list. Moreover, we will have to work harder to build in disaster resilience for almost all major investments that are being rolled out, notably by the government itself in India. Electric vehicle sales are declining. It's perhaps noteworthy that as we speak of climate and climate responses, the one indicator that should be doing well is sales of electric vehicles. But that's not happening right now. India's electric vehicle market saw sales decline for May 2024 compared to the same month last year, Business Standard is reporting. Though there was a modest recovery compared to the previous month, in May 2024, according to data from the government's portal, total EV sales amounted to about 123,000 units, that is down from about 158,000 units recorded in May the previous year, which was also the peak sale of that year. However, despite the year-on-year drop, May 2024 showed signs of improvement compared to the previous month and was up about 9% in contrast to the year-on-year decrease of about 22%. Within electric vehicles, and this is something that you may or may not have followed closely, two-wheelers account for about 52% of total sales. Three-wheelers are 42% and passenger cars are about 5.3% and buses about 0.2%. So the biggest chunk is two-wheelers, which is also not surprising, but followed closely by three-wheelers at 42%, which is, of course, something that you may not have known and is unusual for any electric vehicle market in the world. GDP growth at 8.2% and GVA or cross-value added in focus. So the economy is still growing, though by how much and where needs a little closer inspection. India's GDP actually beat estimates and grew by about 8.2% for the full year, that's 23-24. For the January-March quarter of the same year, GDP came in at 7.8% driven by strong growth in the manufacturing sector. According to data released by the National Statistical Office on Friday 31st May, sector-wise analysis revealed that real cross-value added grew at about 7.2% last year compared to the 6.7% in the year before, that's 22-23. All of this took India's economy to about 3.5 trillion right now. HSBC Research in a note said that while the 7.8% year-on-year March quarter growth surprised once again on the upside, gross value added, on the other hand, grew 6.3% in line with their expectations. This is for the March quarter or the last quarter. The large difference between GDP and GVA growth for a second quarter in a row is explained by a fall in the subsidy bill, says HSBC Research, and adding that GVA is likely a better indicator of the growth momentum. HSBC also says that GDP details show that private consumption remained on a weak footing, government consumption was weak too, as was clear from the fiscal data in the run-up to the election. I reached out to Vivek Kumar, economist at Mumbai-based Quantico Research, and I began by asking him to take us to the latest GDP and GVA numbers and asking him also to explain to us what the difference in the two meant. So there are two concepts. Ideally, they should map each other. GVA and GDP, they're they are like two sides of the same coin. You're trying to measure activity in the economy. Now, the approach is different. GVA is gross value add. Add it. What you do is you try and compute value add it at a sectoral level. So we typically try to think of it as a supply-side measurement of GDP because you're looking at the various factors, for example, at a sectoral level, the primary sector, which is comprising of the agriculture activities, the secondary sector, which comprises of your manufacturing, mining, utilities, and construction, and the tertiary sector, which largely comprises of services, and to some extent, there are some real estate activities as well, along with government services. So this is the supply side of the equation. This should ideally match in theory with the demand side. Demand side of the equation is the GDP. So you measure GDP from what is the private consumption demand, what is the government consumption demand, 
what is the infrastructure demand, what is the external demand, which is again a proxy for net exports, exports minus imports, if you are external demand. So this is the demand side and you've got GV on the supply side. Ideally, they should match in theory, but in practice, we know that it doesn't match. And they don't match because there are always some something which is unknown and there are always estimation errors. And just to also highlight the fact, Govin, that you know, you're trying to measure activity for which you don't have complete information. So for the year ending March 24, you still don't have complete information for all the relevant data points that you're going to. So at the end of the day, it is just an estimate. So as and when you will get more and more information, these estimates will get revised. Going back to the question that you asked, which is more preferable, when uh, in India, we as analysts or as economists, we do tend to prefer the GVA over GDP because of certain estimation issues and because of certain categories of variables within GDP, which probably do not have a ready answer. For example, there are discrepancies in GDP, which often tend to be very volatile. And as analysts or as economists, we at times are at loss to explain that unexplained part of GDP. Whereas GVA is much more cleaner, you have a sectoral view. You also uh, tend to have a lot many sectoral side indicators within the economy through which you can go and cross-check as to whether this is actually happening or not. So GVA tends to be more closer to uh, what the feels like activity on the ground would be rather than GVA. Having said so, I would also uh, point it out at this point in time that the Individual components of GDP do carry a lot of information. So I would rather look at GBA at a holistic level from supply side. If I have to look at demand side indicators, I'll focus on individual components of GDP rather than looking at the overall headline GDP. Right. So looking at the fact that we've had strong growth in the last year and in the last quarter as well, how is the outlook ahead? Now, in terms of strong growth, again, here... There is a dichotomy. There is a dichotomy because yes, growth did see an acceleration over the previous uh, over 2022, but it depends upon which metric you are actually referring. If you're referring to GDP, then growth accelerated from seven percent in FY23 to 8.2 percent. So there was an 120 basis points of improvement or jump in growth momentum as far as GDP is concerned. Whereas as far as GVA is concerned. The acceleration in momentum was just 50 basis points. So it was 6.7 in FI23. It is 7.2 in FI24. So the incremental improvement is much lower in case of GBA. Now, going into FI25, we believe certain segments or certain variables which did provide a statistical boost to both GVA and GDP will probably start to normalize. And by this, I mean that WPI inflation will return to positive territory, will start normalizing. And our expectation is that it could be somewhere closer to 3 percentage points in FI25. So that's a pretty normal scenario. So what it essentially means, Govind, is that when WPI inflation starts moving up, it essentially is a proxy for input prices for manufacturers and uh, industry. And when input price inflation moves up, it impacts your value value. Because if on one hand, you've, you've got output price inflation, which is proxied by CPI inflation. And there's a widespread expectation in the market, including ours, that CPI inflation is going to moderate from 5.4%. So 4.5% is something which is which happens to be Quantico's expectation. But broadly, I think in terms of direction, this is where the market is looking at a moderation in CPI. So essentially at a broader level, what this is telling you is that output price inflation is going to moderate whereas input price inflation is going to go up or in fact normalize. So from an industry perspective, what this means is that you will have a squeeze on margins, which was not there in FI24. FI24 was a great year from a margin perspective. We saw that story playing out across industry and we saw that story in terms of corporate profitability across most of the sector. This was one of the best years as corporate profitability. So FI25, these things will reverse. This is what the expectation is. And from a macro perspective, we already have policy tightening behind us. So there is a record amount of RBI tightening, monetary policy tightening, liquidity is being tightened. And 
last but not the least is the is the regulatory policy. So even the post COVID regulatory for their institutions allowed, that is also now steadily being unwound. So there is tightness on monetary liquidity regulatory and last but not the least is the fiscal policy too. So fiscal policy too is also stepping back from its deficit of nearly nine percent. We are we're talking about the central government deficit. From that peak we are down to 5.6% in FY424. As far as the interim budget signals are concerned, we could be at 5.1%. There's a talk in the market that because of the huge dividend bonanza, the actual fiscal deficit might be even lower than 5.1%. But and that's, that's not the point. I think the point is that the fiscal is contracting, monetary side is contracting, liquidity is contracting, the regulatory forbearance is now getting out. So, from every side, there is a sense of policy tightening, and this will have a lagged impact. So policy tightening tends to have an impact on activity with at least a four-quarter lag. So FY24, we were not expecting any impact on policy tightening to take place, but FY25 will be the year when you actually will start seeing the lagged impact of policy tightening also. So uh, both these two factors... Because of these two factors, we would expect a deceleration in growth momentum. Nothing major as far as the headline numbers are concerned. So as far as GVA is concerned, we are looking at a GVA of 6.6%. That's about a 60 basis points deceleration. And as far as GDP is concerned, we are looking at 6.8%. So uh, you could argue that GDP is decelerating much faster vis-a-vis GVA, but that's also because GDP jumped much, much faster vis-a-vis GVA. So it's more a statistical correction in GDP, whereas in case of GVA, it's more a meaningful correction. So the, the 60 basis points correction to us. Right, Vivek, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Govind. And among other macro news of relevance to you, India will hike road toll charges across the country by 3 to 5% from Monday, according to officials, after putting the annual increase on hold in April, thanks to the country's general elections, according to Reuters. The wire agency also reported that toll charges are revised annually in line with inflation and highway operators put notices in local newspapers announcing hikes of 3 to 5% at nearly 1,100 toll plazas from Monday. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening.